So I want to compare the payment process of Bitcoin on-chain with the off-chain approach of the Lightning Network. So let's start with Bitcoin. As you all know, when you have a Bitcoin address, it is basically like a bank account number and anybody can transfer money to that bank account number. There are some things in Bitcoin that are basically similar to a payment request in Lightning, which basically operate in this way that you have like a QR code device and you can scan it and then the amount that is requested is basically encoded in the QR code and maybe already a description so that you later know why you paid this Bitcoin. But that's just for general UX improvement. In Lightning, it's not quite like that. Um, you need to have an invoice from the payee, from the person who requests some money. You can omit the invoice. I have done a video previously that you can watch here. And um, that's a really dirty hack. You need to like develop low-level stuff in order to like trick the Lightning Network, um, but it's not really recommended to do it this way. So, so as I said, in Lightning, the payee, the person who receives the money, basically issues an invoice and gives it to the sender, and the payer pays the invoice in return for a secret pre-image, and you could call this pre-image just a receipt. In the remainder of this video, I want to discuss why the process in the Lightning Network actually is like this. Why is it different from Bitcoin? Why does it have to be so complicated? Why is there this additional step of negotiating an invoice? Why can't I just send money somewhere and everything works? And by doing so, we will understand what HTLCs or hash time locked contracts are. And that's the other idea of this video to, to explain this concept. In order to understand the payment process and what HTLCs are, we start with a comparison of the real world scenario. You go to somebody and you ask for a price. You say, hey, how much is it? And then you get the response. It's going to be $10. And what you then do is you give the money to somebody else and you return something, the good or the receipt or whatever, a proof of payment. And the idea is that this entire process should be somewhat atomic, right? So in particular, step two and three, right? The exchange of value. You give the money and the person could already hold out the hand with the receipt and you do it instantaneously. Atomic actually means that both steps occur completely or have no effect at all, right? You don't want the situation where you give the $10 but you don't get anything back. On Bitcoin, it's a little bit different. You ask for the price and then somebody might say, well, it's one milli Bitcoin, and then you broadcast a Bitcoin transaction. And you don't get a receipt back from the person who receives the one milli Bitcoin. No, what you actually do is you look at the blockchain and at some point in time um, you see that the blockchain has replied so it's still somewhat atomic which means that you can't abroad the payment, right? You do the payment and you have to wait some time but eventually the payment is either mined and you see it's mined or the payment was declined by the miners for whatever reason. So then you get back nothing. So it's still atomic to, to that sense. How would the situation change if you have some third person in between, for example, a bank or just another person, where you say, you know what, I want to pay $10 to somebody and I give it to a third person and that person should forward the payment. This entire process should be atomic, right? Either the money arrives or you don't pay money at all. So the question is, can it be atomic though? Right? Because you somehow have to trust the person in the middle. Because otherwise the person in the middle will say, yeah, you know what, it's $10 for me, great, I buy some ice cream or I have a great day or I do whatever I want and the other person who was supposed to sell you the good, well, they won't sell the good, but they don't receive the money, so they keep the good, and you are the unlucky person because you lost your $10. So in the real world, how you would solve this issue is you make a contract where you say to the third party, you know what, I give you $10 if you prove that you have given $10 to the pay, or if you promise me to give the money to the pay. But it's even better that I promise you that I will give you the $10, that I will reimburse you if you have already forwarded this. And then of course, we don't say make one contract, but make contracts because then the person in the middle, the bank says, you know what, I will really give you $10 if you give me a receipt because I need this receipt in order to get reimbursed. And then of course, you could include a service fee where you just change the first contract a little bit of saying, you know what, I will give you $11 if you show me a proof that you have forwarded 10. So just to emphasize on the example, the bank will give the $10 first, gets a receipt and then the second contract is being fulfilled. And that's really great. Or is it though? Because I would say in the real world there are some risks involved to this, right? You could first have a badly written contract that is completely underspecified or legally not really binding because it's malwritten. There could be a forgery with a receipt, right? Where basically the middle node just creates a receipt that it has never gone and still runs with the money. 
And then you go to a court case. And going to a court case is very time inefficient. It might be very expensive, right? So it might actually even be better to like forget about the money that you lost instead of settling those contracts on the court. I would say the solutions to this are programmable smart contracts in the Lightning Network. And these contracts are actually called hash time lock contracts. So as this is a beginner's video, I will not explain the cryptography of hash time lock contracts but I will at least uh, demonstrate to you what hash time lock contracts are. And if you look at the previous picture here, that's basically how routing in the Lightning Network already works. It's a chain of contracts, right? Only that in the Lightning Network where we don't forward $10, but where we forward 10 milli Bitcoins maybe, we have hash time lock contracts that are much smarter, much easier to enforce. So hash time lock contracts are just a regular Bitcoin transaction with a special script in the inside, right? And maybe you want to subscribe to my channel because I might have a video at some point in time where I explain this for experts or even for developers. That might be interesting, but here at this point we just understand it's a special Bitcoin transaction. And it's a conditional payment, right? As in the similar way how the contract was formulated, where I'm saying, hey, you know what, if you provide me with something, I will pay you, I will reimburse you. The transaction or this contract is locked for a certain amount of time, so in this conditional payment time, it actually says something like, you know what, you have to reimburse me within the next day, where I'm already sending some somewhere and you have time to like reimburse me and I have time to get the receipt. So the receipt is a secret, random, in best case, unique string that we as Lightning developers usually call the pre-image. What people on the Lightning Network then do is they provide the hash of the pre-image to the person who is supposed to pay the invoice and the payment hash or the hash of the pre-image is part of the invoice, right? You can basically understand this as an identifier for the payment. It is really like the legal contract that I was talking about before from the cash setting, but just without all the disadvantages, right? So it's cheaply enforceable by publishing the contract, which is a Bitcoin transaction, to the Bitcoin network, right? Basically have it mined in the blockchain. Right, that settles all the rules because it was programmed. It's much cheaper than the court system, even though blockchain fees might have been high at some point in time. If you compare this to a court case, it's much cheaper. And usually you don't have to go to the blockchain. The idea of the Lightning Network is to do everything off-chain, right? You just have this contract. And only in the case of a disagreement or a situation where maybe a computer fails, you just publish this contract, which is the Bitcoin transaction, to the blockchain. Therefore, it's not really possible to have a misunderstanding, right? The, the, the contracts are programmed all in the same way. Everyone knows this protocol. And it's working exactly in the way how I said before, where you're basically saying, you know what, if you provide me with this proof that you have forwarded the payment, right, the pre-image, I will reimburse you. And this is enforceable over the blockchain, right, which is really, really great. So thank you very much for keeping with me all this time and for being interested in education about the Lightning Network in general, but also in my way of presenting this. While you're here, I want to ask you a couple of questions and I hope you can answer them for me. I have to admit, I'm currently not so sure about the format of this channel. You know, last week I created this fundraiser where I asked you to donate some Bitcoin that I can buy a new camera to create even better videos. And the response has been astonishing for me. I was really amazed. I thought I would have to advertise this fundraiser in this video again. But apparently we already have reached 91%, so I would assume the last 11 milli Bitcoin I could, in the worst case, even pay out of my pocket. So, so this is really amazing, and I think there were 25 people or more involved in the fundraiser, and that shows me that there is really a high interest in what I'm doing. On the other side, some people, especially on Reddit, but also in the comments here, have complained that my videos are too long and they are too much on self-promotion and not so much on Bitcoin Lightning. Um, but then there's the YouTube statistics that tell me actually the more personal my videos are, the more people are interested in them. So I am a little bit confused what I should make out of this. Also, I'm wondering if I should actually produce more educational videos about the Lightning Network. There's so many topics I could talk about. My list of videos I want to do is basically uh, arbitrary long because this technology is so interesting. On the other side, this is a heavy time commitment. Currently, I pay this mostly out of my pocket, though I have to say there are some people sponsoring me, like Jeff from Fulmo or George from ins.gg. And thank you very much to, to those people. If I would make more videos on a regular basis, maybe two or three videos per week, I would actually have to ask you if you would support me on a regular basis. And if you can consider to support me on a regular basis, maybe you can already drop me a message or give me some feedback on how much you would be 
willing to, to afford for this if you think this content is valuable. But obviously I have to at some point in time see how this is progressing. The new year is starting after Christmas and there I have to see how I pursue with this channel and with this involvement. So it would be really great to get some feedback from you and some thoughts. And uh, other than that, I wish you happy lightning hacking and have a great time.